This is Rob Bell, and this is the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. We actually caught Rob at the end of his work week because on Friday, things get shut down. He's like, that's it. We shut it all down even if the work isn't done. Right, exactly, because the work is done. I'm about to turn this computer off. Right, so we are very fortunate to have something plugged in, (laughs) and we are in the back house. Thank you very much for hosting. We appreciate it. It's cool to be here. John, of course, is back up in the Bay doing business. I am fortunate to get the chance to get a crack at you by myself before... Get a crack at you. (laughs) Well, you know, I do have some interrogation techniques, but uh, we're not going to get into that. Yet. John wanted me to tell you that you are his spiritual advisor. Uh, and then uh, our friend Debbie Ryan, who loves you, like she, jump up and down like Beatles screaming, wow. loves you. Said, and I was said, I'm Debbie? Gonna, is that your name? Debbie, yeah. Hi, you, Debbie. We, yeah, we sent her a little uh, video last time. And I said, I was going to see you. And basically, she just wanted you to know that she, yeah, she loves what you do. So you have a huge fan up in Danville. That's fantastic. And Debbie is wonderful, beautiful people. Her family is great. And we love the Ryans. And they do. They love you. And that's got It's good to have someone you've never met. Love you that much, right? It's got to feel nice. Man, you can come to the back house anytime if this is how you're going <laughs> to sit in that chair and talk. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, one of the things we like to do in the Break It Down show is, is spread the love and recognize, you know, the things that people do. Like uh, we had Sly Stone on the show and Sly Stone has lived a very damaged life. You know, he's done a lot of, we're talking Sly Stone, the uh, funk uh, musician. Sly and the family stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We had him on the show. He doesn't do interviews, but it was good for us to be able to say, look, we put that we were going to talk to you up and 10,000 some odd people engaged you know like yeah, uh, yeah wow we would love to see it's more of him you know and he doesn't mm-hmm. ever get to hear that because in his world it's a very cloistered protective world because you know he can't be exposed to regular people because so many people have taken things from him or wanted things from him uh. so he's kind of cloistered so it's good for him to hear hey you still have an impact on people's lives i don't know if you've heard this piece of music but this is this belongs to, like he's the inspiration for the ins- people that inspired that inspired the people that inspired the people that make the music now so it's cool to be able to tell him things like that and to tell rob bell that hey it still works even when you're not physically there you are still making people go crazy that's cool <laughs> That's amazing. You do the shows at Largo. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is so people can understand like if they want to come see you, what, what the whole experience? I'm just wrapping up a tour mm-hmm. where we, we get art galleries and dance halls and clubs. And I do like a seven hour event on an all day Saturday, 10 wow. to 5. Yeah. And we get we bring in chairs and we do it in the round. Uh-huh. So I'm in the middle and then it's like a big living room. Huh. And I take people through all these ideas about essentially it's all based on these ideas in this book I wrote called How to Be Here. How, right. how to not feel like you're missing out on your life. How to think about work, family, money, ambition, hmm. rest, play. Here are some ways. So what happens is I'll do I might I might do an idea for 45 minutes and then People will start responding to the asking questions, and then that'll take us down this road or this road, and then we'll come back, and I'll do another idea. And uh-huh. it's sort of like everybody sort of surfs the wave together. It's this really interesting thing that happens. And you would be so compelled. People will at, they'll, they'll share. They'll ask a question, and in 20 seconds, reveal with such staggering honesty. I run a company... I make seven million dollars a year. I'm bored out of my mind every day. I want to quit. What do you have to say to me? Yeah. Uh, my mom died nine days ago. What do you have to say to that? Yeah. I remember in Minnesota at a club called some Mill City Nights. Mm-hmm. A guy stands up, really big, solid dude, and he says, "I'm a junior high teacher," and he names some in this incredibly small town in the Dakotas somewhere, and he says, "Kids keep killing themselves." In our town. Oh, right. Okay. Like, like yeah. off the chart, statistically, number of kids. Right. What do you have to say to that? It's the kind of stuff that people will stand up and say. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing. So I've been doing that tour. Yeah. Um, and the last one is actually in LA in November. Um, oh, okay. But then the Largo show is, Largo is sort of this legendary music comedy club in LA. Right. And they're like, no, no phones, no cameras, no tweeting. So there's like this sort of really interesting space that's been created at Largo huh. and Flanny who owns it's been very careful about lots of people try out new material there um lot Sarah Silverman has a regular gig Pete Holmes has a regular there oh, okay right Adam Sandler shows up a lot it's sort of this I can't even explain it well you saw the the setting when you yeah. got there it's like just this 
time, it's like a timeless space, this old like 300 person mm-hmm. theater and all these amazing people do their stuff there and somehow Flanny invited me to do my thing there. Well, so. well, well, not somehow. I mean, you're good <laughs> at what you do. Look, you can't stand in the middle of a circle of 300 people and say, throw it at me. And, that's what and, I love actually. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> that's why you get to do that. You have this <laughs> ability to withstand this. I, I would have similar experiences where I would go out and I would talk to people Mm -hmm. and I've got to sort through a bunch of of nonsense because there's so much pain in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's so much just damage. Yes. I come back, I've got PTSD from being there for a year or two or whatever. And I'm just speaking on the proverbial high, not just me specifically, but those folks live there in that every single day and there is no ice cream and there is no air conditioning and there isn't electricity. Right, right, right. So their schema gets bent and so you're trying to work in a world where you have these vertical schemas and and personalities but in reality everybody I interact with is is got holes and damage everywhere you know yeah so I would go and I would talk and they would I call them the tales of woe and and I have a book of woe in the back of my head that I just all these tales of just like I cannot believe the pain that you have been through and Mm -hmm. that you are actually you know people that have broken teeth no dental care you know like we don't understand like holes where parts of their teeth were this is their day-to-day life you know yeah. how much harder is life when uh, they draw the water out of a out of like an irrigation ditch and on the, the end where i am at the end of the stagnant end of it the water is literally purple and then 100 yards down some guy's sucking it out into a tank and then taking it to the, around the neighborhood and filling 55 gallon drums rusted ones and selling this water that's where they you know and so we come in and and so they throw these problems these giant like you know my wife died nine days ago kind of problems they're yeah. like well, we have no electricity, we have no water, and I have to go, I can't help you with that. And I, I have to let them throw all this stuff at me. And then I said, what's the simplest thing? What is the basicest, most common thing that we should absolutely be able to fix, like tomorrow? What's that thing? Because that's the only place where I can work. I can't fix yeah. electricity problems. So I don't know if you kind of d- do a technique like that, but that's where yeah, I... Yeah, I begin with, and I've had a couple friends point this out, who have, who have especially these things I've been doing this year, these all days in different cities. My friend, uh, a couple friends have pointed out, it's like you're creating this space where people can can feel whatever it is they need to feel because the pace of modern life is you just keep going. Like you gotta wake up tomorrow. Like yeah. the kids need lunches. You gotta pay rent. You gotta yeah. like, you got a parking ticket. You got like, that's just, it just keeps coming. And I think one of my jobs is to create a space mm. that hasn't already been co-opted by commerce, politics, religion. Boy. Yeah. What I do is a creative space where at the end there isn't going to be somebody who goes, okay, now sign up, or mm-hmm. now you have to buy the product, or now we need to convert you. It's mm-hmm. a it's a blatantly spiritual space that hasn't been co opted mm. by some entity that like at the end of the day, no matter what good happens, we still need your uh, yeah. email. Right. And, yes. That's so funny. And and by spiritual, I simply mean depth. Right. Uh, I mean acknowledging that which is not accessible through your five senses but is real so when people say my spirit was crushed or i'm wondering what the point of all this is or i was feeling trapped that's all spiritual language that's describing realities that aren't as obvious as flesh and blood and rocks and trees and Mm -hmm. rivers and frogs and uh that's what we need as human beings so whether you're the ceo or the mom or the Mm -hmm. i remember uh people will literally just say i'm an actress I've been trying to get parts. I've been going to auditions for 11 years. When do you just give up? Right. Uh, or a, a one entrepreneur said, I had this idea for a product. It got picked up by all these grocery stores. But then I made some choices. I, I made some bad decisions. Then I came up with another product. Right. And then I made a bunch of bad business decisions. And he's like, in this, this is New York City. In the room, he says, I'm realizing that... Every time I got close to breaking it wide open, I sabotage. Mm. So so that's the kind of thing. And and my experience has been people were all carrying around Mm. these business, family, relationships, past, trauma. We're carrying around all this stuff. And what we need, going back to your question, what do I begin with? I begin with solidarity. Mm -hmm. You need a room full of humans to go, yeah, that's tough. Yeah. You actually think you're looking for solutions, but what you first and foremost crave is some human solidarity. Some people just to go, 
that's hard. Because oftentimes what we're doing is we're just looking for somebody to acknowledge mm -hmm. our pain, struggle, ambiguity, conflict. Yeah. We just need someone to go, that must be difficult. And something yeah. within us goes, <sighs> they haven't given you one solution. And yeah. yet something within you, that's the thing you were actually asking for. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's what I've noticed again and again and again is before we ever talk about next steps or what you're going to do tomorrow or solutions, mm -hmm. we're going to acknowledge your experience mm -hmm. and what it is. That's where I start. Wow. <laughs> That's great. I mean, and it's, it always just strikes me how so many times we talk to people from, I told you about Preston Glass, the uh, maestro of the lush ballad, and all the similarities. <laughs> maestro of the yeah. lush ballad. <laughs> That's, That's good. good. Yeah, we don't have to take our clothes off to have a good time. <laughs> oh, no. That song, right? I yeah, sure. Now it's sure. Good. We can dance and party all night or drink some cherry wine. Uh-huh. Anyhow, so Jermaine Stewart, rest in peace, sang that song for us in Preston Glass. Help them make it. So you sit there and you look across at your partner and you're like, come on, baby. You know? <laughs> so there's all these parallels where these people we talked to are incredible. Preston is incredible at making music. You are incredibly talented in the spiritual world. I, I, I am incredibly talented at going into really shitty, fucked up places where people die <laughs> and talking to people, you know? That's a fantastic line for your CV. <laughs> right yes. There. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. And so the thing I've been thinking about lately is trust. Mm hmm. Like if you read Stephen Covey's books, uh, those are all great. And it talks about like, you know, be this, be that, and then you can be trustworthy. But how do you build trust? And it seems to me, and I'm trying to reason through this, and this will get to a point we can discuss, but um, <laughs> trust is like on a credit account. Rapport is, uh, is a subset of trust. You can have rapport, but no trust. Like we can get along great. Sure. I love that dude, but I'm not going to lend him any money, you know? Yeah. And then trust has, there's like a... a, a this is where the theory is, so please feel free to attack it. Um, there's a simple trust and a high trust. Like you and I are going to show up 2 p.m., you know? That's simple, yeah. low-risk trust. Exactly, low cost. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You didn't say, hey, come to my back house, you know, because that's a higher level of trust, right? We ended up doing that, but uh, that gets to the next piece. Trust is a communicative path. So I go to these Afghans that have no reason to trust me. I've got to earn trust. I've got to build up an account with them where I do things, what I call fence posting, which sounds like this, this uh, solidarity thing where I'm a warrior, you're a warrior. I'm a dad, you're a dad. You've grown corn, I've grown corn. What's it like for, what our Christmas is like, we create these commonalities and we realize we're actually building the same kind of life fence, right? So that slowly, incrementally grows my trust bank and then I can test the trust and say, I'm gonna be here tomorrow. I'm not gonna be like a American white dude and show up at 2 p.m. on the dot. I'm gonna show up Afghans. God willing, I'll be here around 2, and then I wander in at 2.30 because Afghans do that. That's how they do it. So if I can build this trust up to where I can now start to get into higher risk, more complex trust requests like tell me what we can do for you within the confines of this Taliban influence so that we can actually make some progress. Because before that, you're just going to get this sufficing behavior where they're afraid to participate and they only do just to protect, just to withstand my intrusion on their life. That's a lot of words. I'm going to shut up in a second here, but that's sort of how I see trust in yeah. building it. Absolutely. And what's also interesting about that is you begin, there's my dog. My dog, your dog doesn't trust me yet. <laughs> my dog, yeah, just pretend like she's not there. She needs it. to like check you out yeah. for a while. Well, we're going to build some trust. Yeah, exactly. She's looking at her. She's going to sniff your bags. She's going to just see what's going down for yeah. a while. You have to begin with there's like an element of patience mm -hmm. because for so many people, so much of life is about what can I get out of this? Okay. So to move from what can I gain through this person, this place to just your presence. Mm. And like you are saying in a country like that, there are so many odds stacked against you that you have to come in almost agenda free. Right. Yes. And if it's almost like you surrender your agenda is the only way to ever actually get anything done on your agenda. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in and add another level to that too. You can't have, so it's always the commander's agenda. Agenda. So we're going to take this governor and shove him around his electorate who didn't really elect him and uh, 
do what's called like a mobile democracy thing and like this is your governor love him and he's like it's really uneasy for me cause I yeah. don't know these people right so it's allowing instead of allowing him to collect elders through his own natural written word means of communicating so and then the army person god bless the army people I love them they'll say I don't care about the governor's agenda my commander wants this so you have this intent that has to be satisfied because that's normal for the army it's not wrong it's just, it just doesn't work in these conflict ridden areas and then the other thing is, is you have to remove your ego so you can see the ego in perspective of others. Because this, this goes back to the infrastructure of the mind, furniture in your mind stuff we've talked yeah. about, where you can't navigate through my mental living room if you are only worried about your egocentric view. Yeah, and you have to actually listen. Boy, yeah. You actually have to listen. And... What's fascinating to me is how many times people are telling you all sorts of things, like in a question, or they're telling you. So you think about somebody who works in you know a cubicle farm somewhere, mm-hmm. and they're at the they're in the office kitchen, and the person says to them on a Monday, "Man, I had a rugged weekend." Mm-hmm. I was trained as a pastor, so somebody telling you, "Man, I had a rugged weekend," is parentheses. Please ask me, yeah, <laughs> why my weekend? Yes, yeah. people are. They're telling you so many things mm-hmm. in and around and through the things that they're saying. Yes. There's a thousand tells. Right. This person who keeps Instagramming what an awesome time they're having, why are you in so much pain yeah. that you have to keep Instagramming how much fun you're having? Yes. Are you, what are you convincing yourself of? Right. Yes. Yeah. Why that are we selling? are communicating yeah. a thousand different ways. And, I, and, I, and generally, it's because we have all sorts of pain that we haven't dealt with. And generally, what you need is somebody to actually listen. Mm. Uh, I, somebody this week I noticed in the course of a couple of hours they apologized for a number of different things that weren't on them mm-hmm. and I was finally like hey you keep apologizing for things that aren't your fault yeah so I don't know what that's about but but you don't need to apologize to me yeah uh, and so, it, it sorry was, about that <laughs> <laughs> right that's no the next word. <laughs> yeah they and I mean they were doing everything short of apologizing for the weather yeah and it, it was like Oh, there's, there's like, that's something everybody's carrying around stuff. That's, you got to work that out. There's something there. You can work that through. You can sort that out. But yeah, what you are talking about is the power of, of listening and entering in. You surrender your agenda and there's always a chance on the other side, you may actually get to do something with it. You can smell it too. You can smell when somebody wants something from you and everything they're doing is to get something. Mm -hmm. It's like we have this old old primal instinct of i'm not safe Mm, okay um i'm not safe this person is here to get something from me and that's what when you you tell those afghan stories that's what i pick up what i pick up is they're going what are you doing here Mm -hmm. are are are, what do you want from us and when you come in and go who are you how's it going what do you need yeah changes everything yeah, because we'll come in and we'll say, we're going to put the wells here, 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 and here. And then I'll stop and say, who have you talked to here in the area? Oh, I'm going to tell, tell you the tale of the dam. And this, this is a good tale. We're off in this canyon area. It's in Afghanistan. There's a lot of canyons. And we've decided to build what's called a check dam. It raises the level of the water. It's not like a dam like the Hoover Dam. It's just meant to raise the level of the water to charge these irrigation ditches. So we've done that. And the Afghans keep hacking away at it with their tools. And so we keep, because we're the army, we will not be defeated. This becomes this this point of contention. And we will pour more money into this dam until the point it actually becomes a dam. And there's water leaking all around it. It's terrible. And so I start talking to the people. What's the problem with this thing? You know, the army thinks that you guys want this. What's going on? They're like, well, first off, you didn't talk to the Marab, who's like the water dude around here. He doesn't want this to be here. And that's his, this is his area. He's the water expert. Okay, cool. And uh, you've blocked our direct path to the mosque that we like to celebrate at and worship at. So that angers us. Uh, and in general, this whole thing is going to fail at the first rain. And, and really, they were, they were ultimately right about that. Like, this thing was compromised <laughs> from the moment we built it. And so uh, it did charge. They were the, right. Yeah, they were right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the things they wanted were totally different. I go and I talk to the army guy and I say, okay, so we talked to the Marab, knowing the answers already. He's like, nah, I don't need that guy. Like, okay, you're not going to pay attention to the guy whose job it is to handle water in his valley. That would be a mistake. You know, now you've, you've put your agenda and your egocentric view on top of him. Uh, you've also disregarded all the other people. Why are they hacking at it? Uh, because they don't understand what it does. 
but they explained to me what it does. And they've also said, yeah, we pump the water. Uh, we have pumps with gas, and we pump the water up into the thing. The, whenever we need to, we just turn the pump on, and then down it goes. Well, you guys have it so that's always water going down, and we have other needs downstream that we need to re- So they actually live there, and, and they know what the river is wow. supposed to do. We can't be bothered with that. So long story short, first rain comes, thund- thunder and lightning, and it's crazy, and it's loud. And I'm like, I can't stop envisioning this dam. And I, I'd show you a picture of it. It's 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 ridiculous. This thing it was huge. You would be twenty feet in the air standing on top of it. This is how big this structure became. And the next day, gone, no dam. And when I wrote my report, I wrote I went down to the dam and I did a strike through on it and I wrote river <laughs> and then I showed a picture because it was just a river there and it's the little tiny stream of a river. But that little tiny stream and the people had defeated this big army monolith. So. Chapter two in this story is is uh, the governor's like, I'm going to get the Americans to fix this. And USAID has a small-scale hydroelectric capacity, and this valley has no electricity. So here's the ability for the governor to say, everybody in this valley is going to have electricity. You know, we're going to build this thing. This is why we're going to have it. I'm going to get this done for you. And what a chance to bring the people of Afghanistan in this valley closer to the government. Ask me if we built a hydroelectric small-scale dam. We didn't do it. It didn't happen. No way. They kicked, They didn't even pick the ball up. We had this great win all ready for them. People that don't have electricity, that don't have the internet, all these things that can chill them out. And we couldn't be bothered. Never listened once. Only about our view. And we wonder why we have problems in these conflict zones, you know? So what do we do with people in day-to-day lives that come to you with all the, these kinds of problems, knowing how challenging this can be? How do you get them to get out of their own head long enough because there's something that you must do for them. Well, you can't take people where they don't want to go. Okay. So I begin with some people aren't in enough pain. Wow. They're going to keep on this path. And so I, you begin by surrendering people. Because if somebody's not ready and doesn't want this, then now you're part of the problem. And everybody's had somebody in their face trying to change them. Mm-hmm. I mean, how does I mean recovery get, begins by realizing I'm no more controlling people, places, or things. Mm-hmm. So I, I begin... With, you wouldn't believe the number of people who, at these events I do, will say something like, how do I get fill in the blank, loved one, kid, relative, spouse, student, business partner, coworker, how do I get them to do whatever, right? It's unbelievable. You don't. Yeah. You don't. So you can't take people where they don't want to (laughs) go. And and the really, the really, really difficult truth is that some people aren't in enough pain. It, it actually still works for them, even though you're going, why would you keep making these destructive choices? Why would you remain in prison when mm-hmm. you actually are holding the key in your hand? Right. Um, some people aren't in enough pain. They aren't in enough pain to change. And then uh, I think you have to begin by you're not going to work harder on somebody else's problems than they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the number of people I know who are literally spending more energy then this person they're trying to quote unquote help, mm-hmm. getting them help. That's really difficult to watch somebody going down a path that you are like, you know mm. what, you don't have to live like this. Like you don't have to be in that kind of enslavement. You, yeah. you, you, there's actually some joy out there that you could possess. Um, that's very, very difficult. So, so a lot of times what I've noticed is you're helping people. The ego doesn't like limits. Okay. The ego wants to fix it, name it, label it, categorize it, heal it, mm-hmm. organize it, bring structure and coherence to it. Okay. The ego does not like limits, which is you can do this here, mm-hmm. but beyond that, you might not be the savior in this situation. Mm. That is a really, that, that's a moment when people realize that. And oftentimes what happens is this person, you notice this with parents all the time, they have this extraordinary anxiety about they're terrified their kid's going to lose, not get a job, going to end up in a van down by the river, and they have this all this anxiety about their kid. And all their anxiety is doing, because if you run a business, if you're a parent, if you're, you're creating space. Mm. That's what you're doing. You're creating space. And your anxiety is in that space. Right. So a parent who's filled with all this anxiety, your home is now a space that is filled with anxiety and no wonder your kid isn't responding. Yeah. You, 
you have placed a burden on your child that your child cannot bear. So you need to begin with your kid is your kid. Your kid has been living with you. Your kid know, already knows what you think about pretty much everything. Yeah. Do you know right. what I mean? Yes. So totally. let's begin with your anxiety. Yeah. And let's, oh, this is really interesting. In one city, a woman raised her hand and she said, uh, my son has autism. And we went to this therapy center where they watch you and I think film you interacting with your kid. And then they help you better relate to your kid. Yeah. And she said that her kid gets really frustrated when he can't do something. And so she tries to help him and he gets really frustrated. And so that was, so the, the therapists and people watched she and her husband and son interact for a while. And then the therapist sent the kid to, I don't know, some other room and said, I need to talk to you and your husband. And she said, he said, when your kid is trying to do something, and can't figure it out on the first try. And so you as the mom step in. Right. You're making it worse. And he said, you, and this is the kind of thing, this woman is sharing this in front of whatever, yeah. 100 strangers. <laughs> yes. He says, the therapist says, you have to al- let your kid be frustrated. That's part of being human. Right. Just give him the space he needs to express you're not letting him be human. Right. You're trying to prevent his frustration when frustration is part of life. Sometimes you fix things because you've gotten frustrated. And the therapist spent the whole time dealing with she and her husband. Yeah. He's like, never got to the kid because he's like, the kid is actually going to be fine. Right. Um, and, and the number of people I've met who are carrying around all this anxiety about other people. Yes. And to actually help and be compassionate, you have to first surrender. Yeah. You have to surrender this person. Yeah. You may be the answer to their problem. You may not. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to, I'm going to take you back overseas and this is some of the again, go. There's parallels, right? Like it happens all the time. So, uh, and I didn't start this way. I had to, uh, I like to talk about, you have to have a revolution, drop the R so yeah. you can be evolved. Yes. So you, you know, so I had to go screw things up. You learned this in the field. Yeah. I learned it. I learned it by watching. I learned it by going, Oh, I'm an idiot. I've done it again. <laughs> I've inserted my ego again. When will I learn this lesson? And it turns out I'll never learn it, but I know now that I have to constantly be, if you're aware. talking about it, you've learned something, right? Well, that's the thing is I've, I've not learned to stop it. What I've learned is that I can't stop it and that I have to be aware for it. And oh, got it. That's what I've learned. So, uh, uh, and I'm going to do some uh, visual stuff for Rob here. Sorry, podcast folks. I'll try to describe what's going on. Actually, I'll translate. Okay, so we have a governor, and we're trying to learn about this guy. And our perception, so many years of interaction has equaled many bios on this person. And and if we always think in a threat-based frame, the, there's going to be threat-based negative reporting on this person, right? So I've learned to disregard that. Like, it's nice to read these things, but I'd really like to get to learn the person anew. And if they're an asshole, they're still going to be an asshole. But if they aren't an asshole and they're an asshole because everybody said this guy's an asshole and they all believed each other, then we've got a problem. No matter what, this guy's the governor. I'm not the governor. He's going to govern these people. My job ultimately to help the commander is to help that governor become a better governor. And not by telling him how to govern or what to do, but by learning who he was. So I started by just by assessing him and, and I've got some training in body language. So, um, I started watching him interact and just kind of talking and being in his space and sharing it and trying to remove my ego and see what he does. So when he would talk to Americans, he would sit in a chair, just like this chair. And you'd be the American person. He'd sit like this. Just that. How would you translate, translate this position? Like sort of back stiff, leaning back, uh-huh. the farthest thing from comfortable you can imagine. I'm braced. Arm braced, I'm like ready to, ready for impact. Right. Yeah. I just like, you know, and he never did that with me. Always a different thing. And not that I'm better, but I didn't approach him like that. I didn't ask things of him. When he talked to his electorate, when he's outside and amongst the people, his hands are above his heart. Right. And he's talking animated and very passionate. And then Hands above the heart is what excitement. joy openness excitement you know yeah it's more just think more of like up excitement okay. as opposed to joy or or fear because like, it mm-hmm. could be either one but when you have your hands up and you're very animated it can it's a it's you're trying to read a hazy picture kind of like looking for planets where you're like there's a planet there because stuff looks weird so this indicates that he's trying to communicate and he wouldn't do that with the americans ever and so then there was this third phase of him where he was more reflective and more of like the scholar the um the uh, imam, you know, where he was like more religious and his hands were more around his heart when he talked. 
And he doesn't know he's doing these things because I watched him over the course of like two weeks. So what I try to reflect back to the command was, is here's this person who, when you guys interact with him over the course of a number of meetings, he's in this braced position. Like, just like, how do I withstand this? And he doesn't mean to do it. This is just how he feels. But then when he's amongst his people, he's sitting in a normal tribal setting. His hands are high. Everybody's looking at him, paying attention. He's being a leader. And then when he's more this spiritual contemplative guy, you know, his hands are by his heart. And it was just three totally different phases. And we're not trained to recognize these differences and partner with this person based upon these things. Like, let's see if I can create, and I'm big on affect over effect. So let's see if I can create the affect of him having his hands in the air and see if I can get his people to listen with their hands in the air, you know, see if I can get him to do these things. And instead of trying to do things, I'm trying to create feelings that draw people towards him, not towards me, because it's not about me, not towards the commander. But that sounds like a similar thing with this kid. He's, he's, he's fine. The folks running the show need to calm the hell down and let him be fine. <laughs> It, you think you're helping, you're actually making it worse. Yeah. So let's talk about your stuff and your anxiety and your fear. Right. Because this person that you're trying to get to do something is actually responding to your fear how a person should respond to is They don't want anything to do with it. Of right. course they're resisting. Of yeah. course. Of course. Let's talk about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about you. Let's mm-hmm. talk about your stuff. What's going on in there? I don't like it in here. <laughs> always, always, always <laughs> takes you to interesting places. Yeah. And you, you have to allow... Mistakes are okay. You know, like you don't want to be criminal and negligent. They're not okay. They're absolutely necessary. Right. Yeah. You have to make How boring otherwise. My, uh, my uh, three things I tell my daughter, especially when she was younger, just have fun, make mistakes, learn. Really in any order. Just do those <laughs> things. There you, you go. You focus you on go. that, you know. Pete's parenting. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, you made a mistake. Well, okay. Join the club. Yeah, join the club. Good job. High five. Let's, uh, let's go do something fun. This is what I also... Uh, I always joke on every tour that there are seven questions. Oh, okay. And then I'll go back out a year later and there'll be seven different questions. <laughs> and it's uncanny how there's a new set of questions. And I mean, this year, Paris, London, Belfast, New York, Tulsa, mm-hmm. Sydney, Auckland, same questions. Um, it's like whatever, it's some, there's something in the air or something and then yeah. it'll be something different. Uh, but the the one that comes up as much as anything is somebody has an idea uh, business, a piece of art, some new job, school, whatever it is. And they're not doing it because they don't want to fail. Mm. And uh, as soon as my answer is, oh, uh, um, you're going to fail. Yeah. Right. So yes. let's just establish you're going to fail and it's going to be difficult and money is going to be tight right. and some people will get it and some people won't and some friends will become enemies and some enemies will become friends. Hero's journey, basic yeah. hero's journey 101. It's you're going to fail. So the, the only interesting question is, and it's going to be difficult when you think about your life, uh, you're going to have struggles and obstacles. So you might as well be doing something compelling. Right. You might as well be doing something interesting. You might even you might as well be doing something that you that you love. Uh, right. Because either way, that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about. I'm trying not to use sports analogies. And Why? Well, because they're fantastic. You, not everybody gets them. Oh man! You, know? you swing for the fences and put yeah. the ball in the hoop like that. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, but I, I think about like a football player who blows out his Achilles tendon. You would never pick that as an outcome, but you're right. doing what you love. And it's like, oh, I might get a concussion and crush my head a bunch of times and blow up my Achilles tendon. And most likely if I'm a pitcher, I'm going to have my elbow cut open and fit. I don't care about that. I love doing this. Right. So you have to find, I tell Brenna also find the thing that you love, you know, listen to what your grades tell you. You know, if you want to be in this field and you're getting B's and C's, that's great. Find what you get A's in where you're like, I, it's not studying. It's just doing what you love because yeah. if you, and we have that luxury in our country where we can actually pursue these things if we choose yep. to. It's uh, uh, easier said than done though. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure these things out. What? All right. So a, a different 
uh, type of question. What do you struggle with? I mean, you, you can, I cannot find a topic where you will not come back in a positive frame. I'm not even going to try to find something negative, but what do you find as a personal challenge when you, I mean, Rob Bell has problems. Rob Bell makes mistakes. Oh, how long is this podcast? (laughs) Oh, I can think of, I got a list going this week of somebody who, oh, don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like everybody else. Yeah. The same stuff. Yeah. Same, same, all the same where you made a, where you made a move and then later you're like, what was I thinking? You trust somebody mm-hmm. and later you're like, I shouldn't have, what was I thinking? Yeah. But then you realize I didn't, I, I, I asked all the questions you should ask. Right. And then, or you overcommit. Mm-hmm. And then later, like, oh, somehow I looked at the calendar and that looked like that week would be fine. And then you actually lived that week. You're like, what was I thinking? This is like, <laughs> right. this is a lot. Yeah. All that, sure, all that. And then all, who doesn't, the state of the world, um, mm. how do you, I mean, I look at LA Times in the morning. I, I can't. How? I have to skip it. How to have your eyes open and not mm. have your heart broken over and over again by oh. just I mean I'll I'll start with uh what stat did I come across 66,000 homeless in Los Angeles um that we know of how do you how do you I mean and and they go through my trash out here right when, on Wednesdays when the the bins are out H- how do you, how do you what do you do yeah you know so oh yeah yeah I got all this stuff sure yeah yeah how do you how do you do it? How do you do I also, it? you said positive. Sometimes people will say, you know, positive versus negative or optimistic versus pessimistic. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think in those categories, I, th- I think about it in terms of hope and despair. Yeah. And uh, there's actually a text in the New Testament that talks about that hope is the, is the result of suffering, and that comes out of... Um, perseverance and character so what the writer does is move you from positive negative optimistic pessimistic which are ways of thinking Mm -hmm. the writer defines hope as something that happens when you suffer but you kept going and if you suffer but you picked yourself back up Mm -hmm. you actually got through it it that perseverance creates a sort of character in you Right. It cre- it forms something in you. And so you have a hope simply because the next thing that comes your way that a couple years ago you would have been like, oh, I don't know. Oh, you've already been through something like this and mm-hmm. we made it okay. Right. And so it helps me, hopeful people, in my understanding, hopeful people are not, are not the people who are naive, who just sort of shiny, happy people in the face of, Mm-hmm. No, these are the people who actually have entered into the depths mm-hmm. of the struggle and despair and darkness and 66 homeless. And they kept going. Um, yeah. so, so I tend to, the people I know who are most hopeful, it's a, what, what, what's annoying is happy, happy, naive, mm-hmm. which is, just, it's okay. Everything's yeah. going to be fine. And you're like, have you looked out the window? It's the person who's actually seen it, yeah. who's actually been in the ring, but who keeps going. That's what's interesting that. to me. Yeah, I can definitely identify with that. There's, uh, I have, I'm whimsical. Is one of my traits, I'm, I'm, but I'm also rugged. I, I, so I don't mind sliding my <laughs> chips in and be like, you know what? I've gone bust before. What's the worst that can happen? I'm going to jump off this cliff because I'll figure out what I'm doing. I'm whimsical, mm-hmm. but I'm also rugged. Right. That is. It's a bit of a dangerous that combination. With but... That line with your picture, yeah. just frame that thing. Yeah. Sell that through your podcast. That's right. something right there. Whimsical yet rugged. Yeah. Well, you have to be to. Yeah. And what happened? What you're saying? What happens over time is something that ten years ago would have just crushed you. Right. You're like, oh, I'm still here. Yeah. Oh yeah, that it yeah. It, it it begins to lose its power. Oh, you might get fired. Well, I got fired, mm-hmm. and I'm here. Yeah. So over time, the power of your presence. I'm still here. Right. And that that horrific thing I wouldn't have wished by my worst enemy actually happened to me, but I'm still here. So the next time something comes along, it just doesn't have the same power that it used to. And if you keep going, eventually all those things, I've had sound systems 
blow up. I've had hecklers. Sure. I had a heckler the other night with a bullhorn out in front of the club where I was speaking. Like now, it's just like, oh, good, another good story. Yeah. And the, and I remember ten years ago when there, I'd show up somewhere and there'd be hecklers out front. I'd be like, oh man. Yeah. This is a battle. I'm in a battle. Why are they pick? And now it's like, seriously. Yeah. You're just giving me good stories. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, what was it? A couple weeks ago, uh-huh. speaking somewhere, and there were like these very adamant religious folks with a bullhorn out front. Right. But the club is across the street from a live nude okay. review or something. Right. And so I think it's by law, my bullhorn heckler had to stay be across the street uh-huh. from the venue where people were coming in right. for me yeah. to speak. So they were literally standing in front of like a live nude review nice. girl thing, yeah. yelling back across the street, protesting me. <laughs> oh, oh I irony. Would, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have laughed that hard about that mm-hmm. 10 years ago because I would have been, you know, the ego is still like, oh my word, why don't these people like me? And now you just like, you can't write that. That no, is yeah. too good. Just life, life is funny like that. So uh, one of the things that I've learned about over the years is uh, people talk about fight or flight. Fight or flight. Yeah. There's actually a third natural attribute that we just never talk about, and it really inhibits your ability to do the things you want to do if you don't focus on action and do and do do the American thing and do is uh, freeze because you know, there's a lot of animals in nature that. They freeze now. You can't see me. You know they use camouflage. Fight or flight or and freeze. Freeze right. So when an airplane crashes, everybody's like, "Oh, I can't believe I just survived this." And they kind of freeze and they assess instead of getting the hell off the airplane. So a lot of folks die as a secondary result of the airplane crashing. Really? Yeah. And so in life, when these fear-based things, because you're not sure what to do with the input, you know, and you're kind of like, uh, "I'm anxious. I don't. I don't want to be in this job." And you're afraid of leaving, even though you hate the job, but it's literally killing you. You f- kind of f- have this freeze response where you're like, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't fight this, and I'm not leaving. So I'm just going to stand here and take it. This goes back to your pain thing, where you, if you don't realize, like, am I, f- if you don't consider, am I freezing? I, am I hiding from this? Oh shit! Well, let me try fight or let me try flight. You know, you have options. You have options. Yeah, and it's just, uh, for whatever reason, freeze doesn't stick in the vernacular for us. And I found it to be, like, I, I come to a point where I'm trying to make a decision, I'm going to buy a car, whatever it's going to be. And they're really, I've winnowed it down, so there's really no better outcome. Like, any one of these three things, oh, shit, I don't know. I'll just pick this one, because it no longer matters. Like, I'm, it's going to be fine. I'm rugged. I can withstand whatever the outcome is. You know, I've, I'm going to have a, a car payment. If I don't have a $600 car payment, something else is going to absorb those extra hundred dollars that I'm worried about. You know, I'm going to, Oh, got it. it yeah. Right. So it ultimately, like there's no real, there's no better result. Just jump, just get out there and go and go do it. And I can see that being limiting for folks because they're so afraid of, of afraid of the unknown. Cause like in my case, I, I've been shot at, I've been, I should be dead 15 times over. So it's like, well, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I, I I've been in these situations that are much more intense. I, talking to these people that have much worse lives right no reason to expect any kind of reasonable recovery and literally here i can reinvent myself tomorrow have a career mm. for 20 years and then have another career after that you know yeah. so why not just get to jumping or you know fighting or whatever? yeah and you always have power and what the modern world for has done for many people sometimes educated, accomplished people with resources is this odd disempowerment kicks in, which is, I mean, I'm sure you know the successful people like, yeah, just have to, you know, have to put in the 80 hour weeks. Right. Why? Well, you know, I got bills. Well, some people move into a smaller house. Yeah. Some people leave and go do something else. Right. Like you are actually operating from a place of disempowerment when you actually have more power. Mm. Um, And it's fascinating to me how something about the nature of the modern system for so many people, I feel like a a cog in the wheel, a number. I feel like a rat in a maze. I feel like I'm on a treadmill are actually describing their life in the, the language of disempowerment. 
this thing is happening to me. At this time in history when we have more luxury technology options uh, than people have ever had, you have more people speaking about this thing happening to them. And I, I would argue in some ways it's where where capitalistic materialism takes you is you have to just, it endlessly expands up and to the right. Mm-hmm. Whatever you do, just keep making it bigger, 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 and buy more, buy more, buy more. Yeah. And it actually begins to turn in on itself. And you have, and when you say, well, you, you could live more simply. And you could <coughs> actually sell your house and get a smaller one. You get a smaller house. You, you could redux, you, reduce your luxuries. People do this all the time. Right. Um, you actually have more power than you realize. Now, it's been astounding to me how many people are living with assumptions like, well, this is just how it is, which is despair. Despair is the spiritual disease of tomorrow is simply a repeat of today. Okay. Despair is when somebody is enslaved to the belief that tomorrow will just be an endless succession of today and a repeat after that and a repeat after that. Um, but when you move to... So despair, the antidote is a disruption. Tomorrow's not going to be a repeat of today. Okay, and when right. people mm. grasp that, and it's not, it may not even be moving to Idaho or whatever it is. It may just be as simple as you could do that thing that you do each day. You could yeah. do it slightly differently. And I wonder where it would lead. Right. Unbelievable what happens. You could stay and say, I'm going to work this 80-hour week. And if I haven't cracked the code into reducing that within, say, 40 weeks, exactly, I'm going to make a different decision. My decision might be continue on because there is a path here, but now you've got a path. And it Absolutely. could be punched. Now tomorrow is not right. going to be a repeat. That's all we need. Yeah. That's right. all we need. Right. Let's try because this. Because that longer. thing, mm-hmm. when it seizes you, all mm. I look forward and all I see is a repeat of this, it absolutely crushes the spirit. And in the ancient Hebrew wisdom tradition... Life and death, living and dying, were not now, and then you end this life, and mm-hmm. now you're dead. Okay. Living and dying, life and death, were present modes of being. Mm-mm. Okay. So you, you could be wide awake and breathing with a pulse, but be dying, and you could be moments from death, bleeding out, but right. actually be full of life, which is why some of our friends who get cancer mm-hmm. are literally dying and yet are filled with something that's right. overflowing out of them and they're inspiring all of us. Right. Uh, and one of the ways that you know that somebody is dying and one of the things, the problems, because in the ancient wisdom tradition, living and dying are present modes of being. Mm-hmm. The problem in the present is we're surrounded by such blessing, abundance, and luxury that you find people who are actually dying, but they look around and go, my kids are in good schools. My bills are being paid. Mm-hmm. No, but dude, you're dying. And one of the ways you know it is when someone says, I don't mean to be complaining here. I mean, it's not like anybody's dying here. Yeah. I mean, I have a good job. My yeah. kids or whatever. Right. Uh, it's not like anybody's dying here mm-hmm. is, is the tell. Yeah. Because what they're actually telling yes. you is I'm dying here. And what that happened in the so modern weird. world is for so many people, it's not working. Mm-hmm. It's you are at some level bored in despair. You know, this isn't your true self, but you're driving a nice car and you're going to an office and you just had a nice little vacation and so it's like they just go well you know i got all this i shouldn't i shouldn't be greedy it's not greed it's true self this can't be it you're dying and when you tell me Mm. it's not like anybody's dying here yeah except you it's like the drunkest guy in the bar i'm not drunk (laughs) right exactly i guess exactly yeah and in my experience you start talking about this and this way the number of people go Oh, this gives me language for what I've been experiencing is yeah. I I I bought a bunch of assumptions about how life was supposed to go. I just followed those rules. Mm. Those rules aren't actually working, but I've never realized I could s- simply make up some other rules. I have uh, <laughs> certain qu- tells and questions, you know, that, that are ve- very similar where someone tells me something like, "Okay, I heard you say it." You know, like uh, um, in my world, if you brag too much about what you've done and I have to be very careful how I say it because people listen to me and they speak the same language. So I'm like, yeah, I've done a th- thousand combat missions. That sounds incredible. 
you know, there's a thousand mistakes in those missions too. Like that's just part of the context. But you have like these tells that you're looking for and being too braggadocious or whatever. So I like to ask the question, and I'll ask you, when was your last moment that you can remember of just pure joy where you're like, oh my, this is the best, you know, it doesn't have to be the highest highlight of your life, but where you were just like, we're completely filled with joy. And was that time, can you remember that time easier than the time when you were just full of like despair or like pain? <laughs> and inevitably, my friends I talked to when I asked them this question, because I've been trying to figure this out, they're like, I can tell you five times where I just was at the bottom of the pit. And I'm like, what was the last peak? And they're like, oh, 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 four years ago. And I'm like, four years ago, like, why do we do this to ourselves? You know, like, how do, you know, let's focus on some of these peaks a little more. Yeah, the valleys are there and they suck. You know, but identify these. Oh, my word. I can I can name. It happens all the time. My daughter, Halloween is Monday, and my seven-year-old daughter, months ago, uh, I was like, do you? We were talking about what she's going to be for Halloween. I was like, do you want me to dress up this year? Because I, I could, I'll dress up if you want. Yeah. And trick or treat with you. She's like, oh, yes. I said, what do you want me to be? And she says, a pig. Nice. Yes. Ready with the answer. I was like, a piggy? I think she said piggy. And I was like, a piggy? She's like, yeah, a piggy. So last week we went down to like Hollywood costume. Right. I bought a pig head, <laughs> which was just fantastic. Good. This yeah. morning I'm dropping her off at school. Mm-hmm. She says, Dad, three days until you're a pig. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's an affect right there. You've done something powerful in your And yesterday life. she says yeah. to Kristen, Mom, do you realize that you're married to a man who is going to be a piggy for Halloween. Right. This is this is in our home creating more. We have laughed harder. That for Where did she ever get anything like this? Yeah. Where was that like her instantaneous response to me? Go, well, what do you want me to be? Yeah. And I also figured out what I'm going to wear. I have the mask. What outfit I'm going to wear that she doesn't know that's going to take it to like yes. another level. So I already know Monday morning. So, so to answer your question... For so many people, it's about the top of the mountain. Yeah. Dude, we went to Cabo for vacation. Like, that's... Mm -hmm. And what happened to me is I had a serious burnout when I was early 30s, just -hmm. working too hard, going too much. And I was a pastor, and I was doing all these big big events, and it was Mm -hmm. all very huge microphone stages... Um, but I couldn't, it was, it wasn't sustainable. Yeah. And I realized that I was living for these big moments and then the rest of life was kind of hanging around waiting for the next big event. Hmm. And when I had this like burnout, like, I don't know if I'm ever going to do any of this work again. I might be selling shoes from here on out. Uh, what happened is everything got flipped upside down and I realized, which is what the mystics have talked about forever. Right. Which is, it is about your your experience of the the love, the divine, the ineffable, the numinous, the absolute, the mysterious, whatever language people want to use for it, spirit. It is about your experience in the everyday moments of life. It's washing dishes. Yeah. It's dropping your daughter off at school. It's... You're walking to work and you see something you haven't seen before. It's that place where you get coffee and you're starting to actually get to know the person who you see each morning and you're mm-hmm. like, this is actually the thing. Right. So, so part of it for me was it came about through great pain. Um, it was really, there were some really, really dark days. I was like, oh, the, I, I ha- I, we even talked about it as a new normal. I have to turn everything up. I have to think about everything completely differently. Life is not about waiting for the next big thing. Mm-hmm. It's about this conversation we're having right now. Sure. And not being anywhere else. And that's why I use the word joy. Yeah. Because it can be like my daughter and I did a Halloween thing and we had sat down, we had pho and which we're, we like to do. And I said, I'm going to go to this party with this girl that I'm interested in and uh, I need to have a costume. It's going to be good. So, and it's an apocalypse party. So I need to rethink, reconstruct apocalypse and what am i going to be and so we started talking and we figured out that i was going to be a taco oh i love it that's right? good 
Tacopalypse or whatever. You know, I, I can't even say how I want to say it. Taco, taco apocalypse, but all one word. Tacolips. And what I figured out is I'd be one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they're like, wait, what? No, you're not death or famine. I'm like, oh, well, here's the thing. A couple years back, a death blew out his knee. He was down for like six months. Here I am. Back up. And then these guys have great benefits. So when famine's wife had a baby, there's also paternity leaves. I had this whole backstory about why Taco was one of the four horsemen. That's seriously ridiculous. Yeah, right. And that's what we like. We like ridiculous, you know. So I had this whole story, and it was. But we have this moment now. We have this whole story in this this time, and it's not about going to Cabo. Cabo's great, but also here I am having fun yeah. and having this wonderful exchange with my daughter, and that's that's a beautiful moment. And that's the path, and that's the invitation, and that's. Uh, um, when that starts to click, like, oh, there's a whole world within this world. Mm -hmm. And the great people that you respect and admire and whose wisdom you draw from, when, you, when you're with them, one of the reasons why they so inspire you is because they don't actually want to be anywhere else. And, and oftentimes people don't have language for it, but that's the reason why this person so moves you is they're, they're here and they're, they aren't anywhere else. And they have found some depth in the common. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's almost like they're seeing a whole new layer. They're seeing a whole world that is right in front of you. Your eyes aren't, which is why all of the great metaphors generally about spirituality are about, in some ways, waking up, opening your eyes, sight, right. seeing. Um, so when I'm interacting with people, I'm always, so what happened then? Yeah. And what's that like? And who do you see each day? And what's that feel like? And tell me more about that. And sometimes you need somebody to to observe your own story to realize, oh, yeah, this is actually way more interesting than I thought it was. This is another parallel again where <laughs> I do the same thing where I go and interact with this person. They've got no reason to trust me or anything else. I may see them once the whole, the whole time I'm there, but I'll take time to be present in the moment with them. And they'll, say, they'll give me the answer that's right here in their brain, like ready to go, blah, here's the answer. And then when I say, but I don't understand that, Right. And so I take them a little left, and then when I sense it, I ask detail question and drive down deep. Give me another example of that. You know, like so they'll say, um, "Yeah, the government never does anything for us. Never anything ever." Like let's get ridiculous. Let's go left. Okay, there was that one time when and I'll make up names for people. When Morty came down and said they were going to uh, fix the road, and they fixed the road. So it's not no time ever. Right. There's this road. So we're at least one click to the right of never. Right, yeah, yeah. But there's a second time. Oh, now we're like a, oh, got yeah. it. Okay, now we're back toward, moving back towards right. center. And so is Morty a good guy, bad guy? What do you think? You know what? It's not his fault. And you're like, okay, now I'm in the affect. I've got, I know what he's, I know I'm messing around, and I don't know what the answer is yet, but now I'm where the sweet spot is, where if I could have just come in and said, how are things here? Everything's fucked. Okay, great. <laughs> have a nice day. Bye-bye. You know, you can't do that. You have to ask those experiential questions and get that detail and then revel in what's there. In yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well said. Well, that's been about an hour, man. I don't want to that's take That's fantastic. It's Friday afternoon. We broke it down. We did. On a Once Friday again, afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rob. I really do appreciate it. Pleasure. I know John appreciates it and we would love hey, to John, do it again. You know? What's going down, John? Missed you. We ya. look at podcasts kind of like chapters in a book, you know, and uh, they're so good. So, if you'll have us, we'll have you again, too. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. All right, take care. I'm going to shake your hand, too, because I, I love it. Thank you.